until the announcements of a possible impact event at the beginning of the Younger Dryas, around 12.9 Ka. K, remember, is 1,000. A just means annum or annual. So 1,000 years, 12.9 Ka. The KT impact layer that resulted from the cheek shalub impact was the only geological boundary layer known to contain coeval peaks in various impact markers, including diamonds. Here, we compare impact markers from the KT boundary and the Younger Dryas boundary and the 1908 Tunguska airburst layer. Very interesting. Yeah. First order markers related to impact and biomass burning include magnetic spherules, carbon spherules, nano diamonds, both cubic and lonsdalite, iridium anomalies, charcoal, fullerenes, grape-like soot, and widespread extinctions. Observations and analytical data for the Younger Dryas boundary are consistent with all of the Cretaceous tertiary boundary layers. While the last three markers are unknown or inconclusive for the Tunguska layer, Selected markers for cratering events, for example, Chicxulub, are one, a visible crater, two, shocked minerals, three, impact breccia, breccia, remember, broken rock, and microtectites. So at this point, these are not known for the Younger Dryas boundary event. So this has been one of the stumbling blocks as far as the skeptics as far as the skeptics and the critics accepting the idea is where's the crater over and over again? Where's the crater? Where's the crater? Right now we know why there was no crater at Tunguska, right? Because it was an air burst. It wasn't a ground impact. It was an air burst. So it blew over about 830 square miles of old growth Taiga forest, but it didn't really create a, a classical crater. Now, interestingly, and this kind of brings us back to the to the Carolina Bay's discussion, and which we will come back to after we have looked at in more detail at the Tunguska event. But there are shallow elliptical depressions under the epicenter of the airburst, which could be significant. So they go on to say that the discussion here is limited to possible origins of the impact markers and not with impact consequences such as climate change or extinctions or whatever. Several origins may account for impact materials in the YDB, which is the Younger Dryas boundary. One, an extraordinary accretion of micrometeorites, which was proposed by Pintar and Ishman in 2008. However, as they say, this is inconsistent with YDB carbon spheral compositions, including the large concentrations of nanodiamonds found embedded within those carbon spherules. Two, oblique impacts into the Laurentide ice sheet. This model is consistent with the lack of a visible crater and apparent lack of cratering markers as above, as described above, and yet also provides for shock production of the many cubic nanodiamonds and lonsdalite found in the Younger Dryas boundary. Whoa. Yeah, so they're, they're proposing in 2000, this is 2009, the idea of an impact into the ice sheet. And as Brad can testify, he and I have been talking about that idea for as long as we've known in each, each other, which is going on 23 years now. So he says the Tunguska event is commonly accepted as the result of a near-surface aerial burst and has many similarities to the Younger Dryas event. Comet grazing of the atmosphere involving nearly tangential entry of a comet into the Earth's atmosphere with partial detonation and melting followed by escape of the unexploded nucleus into space. This has the net effect of an atmosphere penetrating aerial burst followed by global fallout of detonation products. 
three of the four above scenarios are plausible. Which, interesting that he describes this grazing event, um, because that is very similar to the, uh, to the um, scenario that I envisioned several decades ago. Rather than a direct impact of a comet, a, a, more, a grazing event. I even did a graphic to try to illustrate my concept, and I did this graphic probably in the late 90s, and I may have it right there. Okay, so the the grazing event is the is all the stuff from the tail. Is that what you're saying there, or do you think that the nucleus also comes through? The well, heat? because what's happening, yeah, is it's anytime a comet comes near, uh, you know, like a source, a, a strong gravity field, it's, it's going to begin to disintegrate. Yeah, and that's what we're looking at here. We're looking at a, a series of disintegrations, perhaps spread over thousands of years. But at one point within that cycle of this comet disintegrating, Earth had a very close encounter. And I would suggest that the closest encounter would be the Younger Dryas boundary. But that was probably not the only encounter because if you've got this very large comet, which might be 60 to 100 miles diameter nucleus regularly circling between Jupiter and the sun, yeah. I mean, there could be multiple episodes where Earth is encountering the debris of this disintegrating nucleus. But so that's it, what I was trying to show here, that basically this was a grazing. And see, actually, if you look at this diagram, you see this blue tail. This is the gaseous tail of okay. the comet. This is actually the trail. Those are the, okay. That's, uh, that's, that's thousands of smaller. See, the idea here is that this comet nucleus might, might be 50 to 100 miles in diameter this stuff spalling off of it there could be actually literally millions of of pieces spalling off yeah. the smallest of which are going to be in the range you know of of chelyabinsk or tunguska so yeah this what does this does is create the opportunity for multiple impacts over like like klub and napier and others have been saying for years there's evidence that there are epoch there are bombardment epochs yeah. And this would be associated with the destruction and disintegration of large comets, which they speculate, I think, would enter the inner solar system approximately uh, once every 100,000 years or so, or maybe even more often. I haven't seen their latest um, dating for, for that, um, the, the latest tempo. But often enough that, that um, it could have major consequences for, for terrestrial life. The other interesting thing about a grazing object like that is that it stays in the atmosphere a lot longer than, you know, a much more <clears throat> vertical impact. Those yes. can be like a couple of seconds, but this thing is just can be burning through the atmosphere, exploding, dropping things and, and putting heat out for a long time before it goes back out into space. Yes. Yeah. Yes. The other thing I was thinking too, is that if it grazed the planet, that would obviously like that's a really close approach. So it would have changed its orbit probably enough to where whatever it was before that was regular enough, it moves it out of that regular orbit. And who knows, it yeah. could have hit Jupiter. It could have been swallowed up by, swallowed up by the sun or yeah. the, right. And so what, what happened after maybe a thousand years later or whatever is that we're running into bits and pieces of the tail. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and their point is, is that there could still be enormous amounts of this debris Right. right. Still circulating out there. Comedy. And interestingly, as we get better and better capable of, you know, taking a, a, a census of what we share nearer space with, it certainly does seem like, yeah, it's a lot more densely populated than anyone was imagining a few decades ago.